it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who's also very well known to many of us. Dr. Karen Weiner is a senior medical officer at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the NIH. And she is going to speak to us about advances in the management of hypoparathyroidism. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Weiner. So we're going to talk about hypoparathyroidism today, um, and hypoparathyroidism is a rare disorder um, of mineral metabolism and uh, characterized by uh, low PTH and calcium levels, elevated phosphate levels. Parathyroid gland injury or removal during neck surgery is the most common cause in adults, but in children, the disease usually has a genetic etiology. So, um, conventional therapy for hypoparathyroidism consists of activated vitamin D and calcium, and um, for some patients also magnesium. So hypoparathyroidism is one of the few hormonal insufficiencies not treated with the replacement of its missing hormone. So what are the treatment challenges? So conventional therapy relies entirely on the GI tract to raise serum calcium and completely bypasses the kidney. So um, there's no uh, effect of the kidney to re reabsorb calcium, which leads to high urinary calcium, and then ultimately to kidney damage and renal insufficiency, and then for some, renal failure. Both PTH and calcium circulate in the blood within a very narrow concentration range. Calcium sensing receptor detects um, changes in the blood calcium concentration and modulates PTH secretion and urine calcium excretion. PTH has a direct effect on the bone to enhance bone resorption, on the kidney to stimulate uh, calcium reabsorption and phosphate excretion and activates vitamin D synthesis. Calcitriol, which is activated vitamin D, has a direct effect on the GI tract to absorb dietary calcium and phosphate. So the problem, as I said before, with, uh, with treatment with conventional therapy, as I said, is that all, it, it just relies entirely on GI tract, and many uh, episode patients have GI dysfunction. Um, it completely bypasses the kidney and the bone for main, uh, main, uh, attaining the normal calcium levels in the blood. So these are the key milestones in the development of PTH as a therapy for hypoparathyroidism. The first important advance was in uh, 1925, with the isolation of bovine, which is from cattle, uh, glands of uh, cattle, a bovine P PTH extract, first by um, a person named Hansen and then by uh, uh, James Collip, who uh, actually people know him, uh, he, he actually was involved with um, the development of very first uh, development of insulin. Uh, and he actually won a Nobel Prize with the best three other people for that. But he applied all those techniques to, uh, to, hypo, uh, to uh, PTH. Um, and he collaborated, um, interestingly, with Eli Lilly, who briefly manufactured PTH extract, which then led um, very briefly to a uh, 
one like a one week uh, experiment by Fuller, Albright, and Reed Ellsworth at Johns Hopkins. Uh, the very first experiment to give PTH to a 15 year old Italian boy with uh, post surgical hypothyroidism. And that experiment was um, was awarded because he gave single daily fixed doses over four days, and that increased the serum calcium, decreased the, uh, the serum phosphate, but also increased the urine calcium. Um, and he uh, incorrectly concluded that the action of PTH was uh, with increasing urine calcium. And that was just simply because the dose that he was using was too high. So about 40 uh, years later, uh, at the NIH, um, the PTH-134, human PTH-134 uh, structure was sequenced, and that enabled uh, the investigators at MGH to initiate studies with synthetic PTH-134, and they first used it in osteoporosis. And this became the, um, the preliminary data for actually my studies, which I started in uh, 1991. So we use synthetic PTH-134 because a recombinant PTH, uh, there was nothing commercially on, on the market at that point. So we um, actually, the NIH pharmacy, which is a wonderful resource, formulated synthetic human PTH-134 for us for uh, 22 years. And during that time, we had eight um, different protocols. Um, and um, in, in 2002, uh, recombinant human PTH was approved for uh, osteoporosis. And that was important for us because many uh, hypoparo patients then could use uh, off-label uh, recombinant human PTH for their disease. And as you know, um, in, uh, in 2015, uh, NPS and then subsequently Shire and Takeda developed uh, recombinant human PTH 184 for hypoparathyroidism as a single daily injection. And that was approved as net para. Uh, and it was on the market for about seven years and then very recently voluntarily stopped production altogether. And now there is this long-acting um, PTH by Ascendus, and they just completed their phase three study, uh, which has been uh, published in the, in the past month in JPMR, uh, Journal of Bone and Mineral Research. We studied 192 uh, patients with hypoparathyroidism over a 27-year period. Half of the cohort were children ages 2 to 18, and only one quarter of the group had post-surgical hypoparathyroidism. And the average duration of disease at baseline was 11 years. So at baseline, the imaging studies on conventional therapy demonstrated that half of the patients who had imaging at baseline had evidence of renal or brain calcifications. And these calcifications were much more prevalent in the non-surgical cases compared to the post-surgical cases. So you can see the difference. Um, this is an activating mutation in calcium sensing receptor. It's a completely different disease. And then the episode, the episode, these are very uh, high the, uh, rates of, of renal calcification. Same thing with the brain calcifications. So here's a full analysis of serum and urine calcium in 112 patients and children with hypoparathyroidism comparing twice daily synthetic PTH 134 um, injections to conventional therapy calcitriolin calcium, which is given also in, in two to five doses. PTH maintains an average urine calcium. So you see the PTH data in the blue, maintains uh, urine calcium in the normal range, and there's a little bit of a trend downward uh, compared to uh, calcitriol and calcium. And uh, both arms are kept in uh, just in the low normal, just below the normal range. 
But the main uh, thing here that I'm trying to show you is the, um, the difference in how the, uh, the, the response to twice daily PTH differs according to uh, PT, uh, hypopara etiology. So if, if you look at the post-surgical cases, which are shown in blue, uh, they have calcium in, in the normal range, urine calcium in the normal range. However, if you look at the um, Avocet patients, shown in red, they also have calcium pretty much in the normal range. But their urine calcium hovers continuously in the upper uh, limit of normal. And this, I, I think, is probably due to the fact that vast majority of absent patients are taking um, uh, glucocorticoids and many of them have malabsorption and require higher doses in the post-surgical cases. So to further investigate the different uh, responses according to etiology, we analyzed data from 35 patients examining 24-hour um, pharmacodynamic responses. And that means we just look at a response to some um, usually it's a drug, and so this is a uh, PTH given at time zero and 12 hours. And um, so this compares the two, etiology, two etiologies, post-surgical, which is uh, blue, and the um, abacid shown in green. And you can see that the, the serum calcium is pretty much the same with a little bit more fluctuation in serum calcium for the opposite patient. But the urine calcium is significantly different between the two etiologies. And this is where you see the difference. Um, and um, you, you see much more uh, fluctuation. And also, the urine calcium is significantly higher in the opposite patient compared to the post-surgical cases. So most of our studies, we, we examined pharmacodynamic responses to PTH. And this is our initial study examining the effects of a single daily PTH injection, shown in red, given at time zero here. Um, and as compared to uh, conventional therapy, which is calcitriol and calcium, shown in the, the gray. Uh, so the data confirmed the well-known physiologic effects that we, we all knew uh, were present in the kidney at the, at the time of that study. Um, but what, what's interesting is, it, well, it shows the, the rapid rise in, in uh, urine phosphate, in cyclic AMP, uh, and the uh, decrease in urine calcium excretion. But what we noticed is that the urine calcium excretion um, profile has, has a biphasic response to this once daily uh, PTH injection. And um, so th this biphasic response, of course, includes classic mediated reduction in urine calcium. Uh, but this is preceded by calcium receptor mediated rise in urine calcium excretion. Um, and this happens right after the dose is given. So um, we assume that the magnitude of this response is PTH dose dependent. So to avoid the periods of hypercalciuria just after we give a dose, we reduce the dose, uh, the PTH dose, by increasing the injection frequency. So that led us to test twice daily injections. And, and sure enough, we, that uh, decreased the dose by 50% and also decrease the urine calcium excretion because you didn't get as much of that. Um, anyway, that was mitigated. It wasn't completely erased. Um, so with this in mind, we hypothesized that the insulin pump would be the ideal tool to mimic normal PTH physiology. The PTH pump delivers set microboluses in microliter amounts uh, given at programmed intervals throughout the day. And this is an example of a basal rate uh, for one of my adult patients, and she got just three pulses an hour, which is 0.7.2 micrograms of PTH a day. That's an extremely low dose. I mean, I'm sure the hypopower patients uh, in the audience will agree with that. 
So we first tested this in adults with post-surgical hypoparathyroidism, and here are the results from a randomized crossover study comparing uh, PTH by pump versus twice daily injections. So the pump da data are in black and the injection data in, in this white uh, here. And um, so the BID uh, injection and the pump delivery of PTH produce normal serum, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus. But the main thing is that there's a 50% reduction in urine calcium excretion um, and a 65% reduction in PTH dose compared to the twice daily injection arm. And also the higher, uh, there's higher serum calcium with reduced magnesium supplement requirement. And then um, in the same study in adults with post surgical hypopara, uh, there are, um, these are repeated measures of urine uh, um, calcium excretion and uh, magnesium. To do that. Um, this is not to the children here. Okay. Um, and you can see the um, there is a very steady state with no fluctuation in uh, the patterns that. Uh, the pump delivery by PTH produce. And so um, this was in accord with what we had anticipated uh, for this, this uh, method of PTH delivery. So pump ther therapy of PTH was highly effective in children and adolescents with Apicid or with an activating mutation of the calcium sensing receptor. So we observed that um, the pump produces normal serum uh, and urine calcium levels with minimal or no fluctuation. And so you can see that this is uh, very similar to what the adults had, just this very steady state pattern uh, in response to uh, PTH given through the pump. Um, and additionally, in the, in the very same uh, patients with um, Apicid and with calcium sensing receptor, uh, defect the two different etiologies of patients. We had a 60% reduction in the PTH dose. Uh, markers of bone turnover reduced by uh, up to uh, 60%, and there's a 40% reduction in magnesium supplementation. So, in non surgical cases, which are so difficult uh, to, to uh, treat, they responded very well to the pump. And the other thing is that the non-surgical and the surgical cases were very similar in their responses. So it wasn't like in the injection um, where you have that disparate response, that they're very similar and they both respond very well. So to summarize and to further illustrate my point, with increasing injection frequency, the progression from once daily to twice daily injections and then PTH delivery by pump. Uh, daily um, uh, PTH dose is reduced by half with each of these steps. And the urine calcium excretion level and amount of fluctuation is reduced. And then when you get to the pump here, um, there is essentially no fluctuation in urine calcium excretion. So we concluded that the pump is the method of delivery that best mimics normal physiology. So PTH is given as hormonal, hormonal replacement therapy and it has to be safe for lifelong use. And I, I think that this has always been the, uh, the problem with the FDA and our treatment with PTH uh, hypoparathyroidism. So I've shown you some data on uh, how we monitor Kidney, which um, is, is important um, to because the, the kidney, there's a tendency of hypercalciuria, and um, we, we need to avoid nephrocalcinosis and renal insufficiency. But also, we have to look at PTH effects on the bone. So, patients with isolated 
hypoparathyroidism, post, post-surgical uh, cases with no other health issues or very few health issues, usually have mildly elevated uh, bone mineral density. Um, by contrast, the apposite patients are unusual in, in the uh, group of hy- hypopara, uh, most of the hypopara that we know, in, uh, certainly in adults, because they have, they tend to have low bone uh, mineral density, um, and for the various reasons that I, that I um, listing here, and uh, the first it would be malabsorption, and in children leading to poor weight gain and linear growth can uh, interfere with bone acquisition, uh, growth hormone deficiency, hypogonadism, delayed puberty, irregular menses. Chronic inflammation uh, also adversely affects bone of all ages, and the use of pharmacologic doses of corticosteroids, as we all know, affects the bone, adversely affects the bone. Um, So we're all familiar with these uh, reference curves for height for um, for girls and boys. we have the, the uh, curves showing um, linear growth, height, and then weight on the bottom here. And what's, uh, and then uh, here we have reference curves for bone mineral density, the, the girls uh, on top and the boys on the bottom. So this is very similar in, in terms of our understanding of how growth works in childhood and in adolescence. Um, but what's, what's interesting here is that, um, first of all, there is a shift to the right in boys compared to girls in both uh, linear growth and in bone accrual. So the meaning that um, boys will reach their final adult height around 17, whereas girls, you see it's around 14, 15. Uh, and this, this obviously is different for each child, uh, depending on a lot of different things. But looking at over here uh, with the males versus the females, you can see just looking at these curves that um, the males are still accruing bone in the very late adolescent stages uh, compared to the girls. So the, the peak one is peak bone mass. This is something that was really a revelation to us because we, we actually obtained these reference data. Um, this is the bone mineral density in childhood study um, and it was uh, sponsored by the NSCHD. Um, so it, what's interesting is that the, the girls will continue on after they complete their, uh, they, they finish uh, their height. Um, into say 19 or 20, boys will go much further than that. In fact, their bone, they're gaining bone and muscle sometimes into their mid 20s. So this is something we have to keep in mind when we treat uh, children who may be at risk for um, poor bone accrual for whatever reason it might be. This figure shows a bone mass lifeline in women comparing normal uh, on the top here, and then someone who had some kind of a compromise uh, during their uh, childhood. And you can see um, how that affects the whole trajectory throughout their their life. So there are two important messages here. The velocity of bone acquisition is greatest in childhood, and you can see especially uh, in puberty, which is a little bit later here. Uh, th- this, this trajectory is a, a very rapid rise in um, bone mineral accrual for the normal child. And then during the adult years, uh, there is bone mass stability. So there's no net bone increase or decrease. Bone formation and bone resorption um, and I'll, I'll get back to this in, in a couple of slides, should be balanced. 
So there is bone turnover, but it should be balanced. And there, in, in a normal adult that's healthy, there should be no net increase or net decrease. And in a woman, once hypogonadism that takes place later in adulthood, that's when uh, the, the balance shifts to losing bone. So bone health is typically assessed by bone mineral density measured with imaging techniques such as what's called dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, uh, DEXA, uh, D-E-X-A. Uh, so the DEXA scanner uses these uh, X-ray beams with this very, very low radiation exposure. And any of you who've had a DEXA scan probably noticed that the technician doing it is not even wearing any protective gear because it is so low. Um, and this is an example of a scan of your the lower back. It's called the lumbar spine. And abnormal scans are a red flag for changing medical management or even changing nutrition or whatever might be um, causing that the, the problem with the bone mineral density. So another way to monitor uh, bone health is by measuring markers of bone turnover in the blood and in the urine. So these markers reflect the activity of two cell types, um, the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts. So the osteoclasts are cells responsible for bone breakdown, uh, bone resorption, and the osteoblasts are cells responsible for bone formation or forming new bone. And the biomarkers associated with that are uh, shown here. And so usually we measure one of each kind, resorption and formation. And you probably all recognize alkaline phosphatase, but usually what we do, because alkaline also comes from the liver, we usually do we measure bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. So here are results from our long-term observational study of 14 children and adolescents with either Apicet or with an activating mutation of the calcium receptor, all of whom received twice daily PTH134 injections. And um, so compared to age match norms, so these are Z scores. That means we're comparing them to normal kids. These are kids from the bone marrow density childhood study um, that were obtained longitudinally. So because they're obtained over six years, uh, we can actually do norms for height velocity or uh, bone accrual, bone acquisition velocity. So these are actually Z scores for those velocities. And so it turns out that the height velocity for the, this group of kids on twice daily PTH was normal because you see the Z scores are hovering around zero. And that means that this is the, 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 meet, the, the mid center uh, norm for, uh, for, for normal kids. Um, and same thing with the bone mineral density. You have whole body um, and um, lumbar spine and then at the, at the wrist, the uh, distal radius as well. And the distal radius, the very first uh, year, they, the bone accrual lagged, but then caught up later on um, from years two to five. And then in adults, we looked at the uh, same thing in adults. Three-year study measuring bone mineral density by DEXA, um, and also markers of bone turnover. Um, and so the DEXA data is shown on the left, and the markers are on the right. And so there's no significant difference, you can see, between PTH, which is shown in red, and the, um, uh, the uh, calcitriol arm, which is in gray. And there's actually also, uh, not as no significant difference between the two arms, but there is no in significant increase or decrease, no anabolic or catabolic effect uh, on the bone. Uh, and that's what, as I said before, that's what uh, we want to achieve. We do not want 
this is not a treatment for osteoporosis, it's a treatment for hypopara. So we want it similar to other adults where the bone is steady state and remains constant in, in the adult during uh, the, the adult years. So as I said before, adults with hypoparathyroidism have above normal BMD, and this is a very mild elevation. You can see here, this is, a, 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 this is old data from the 1990s from Australia from a very prominent uh, investigator. And um, just comparing uh, hyper and hypopara, you can see the hypopara patients in the, uh, in the gray here. And um, the, the BMD z-score is just plus one, meaning that this is a mild elevation. This is not associated with clinical symptoms and it's not considered a bone disease. And here on the left are bone data from adults with hypopara receiving PTH1 to 84, given as a single daily 100 microgram uh, or uh, 100 microgram every other day, so every, either every day or every other day for three years. And then they added um, lower doses in the subsequent years. And this regimen it, uh, uh, caused a, uh, what looks like an anabolic effect in most areas of the bone, uh, and, but a catabolic effect uh, where there's bone loss at the radius. So therefore, this large once daily fixed dose of PTH 1 to 84 nat para was not physiologic for the bone as a long-term lifelong therapy. So in summary, um, hypoparathyroidism due to APS1 is often refractory to conventional therapy. PTH1 to 34 given by twice daily injections reduce mean calcium excretion compared to calcitriol therapy and responses to PTH injections, twice daily injections, differed according to etiology. And twice daily subcutaneous PTH produced normal linear growth and bone accrual in children. Pump daily produced the most physiologic profile of serum calcium, urine calcium excretion, and markers of bone turnover with a reduced PTH dose. And response to PTH delivered by pump was similar across etiologies. So there are a few emerging therapies uh, for PTH with high, uh, for patients with hypoparathyroidism, and um, there, the first one is a PTH analog I mentioned earlier uh, called Transcon PTH, and that is a um, um, molecule that is transient, that's PTH 134 transiently uh, conjugated to a linker, and that, uh, uh, along with a carrier molecule, and that increases the half life. It increases the PK of the, this peptide, and it, it becomes a long acting PTH. It's, it's actually very similar technology to long acting growth hormone. In fact, it's the identical technology. It's, it's the same. Uh, it's a transcon uh, growth hormone. And then there's LAPTH, uh, um, not as advanced in their, um, their clinical studies. I think they're phase two now. Um, and that's by a French group, Amelot. And that, that, that would also be a single daily injection um, for patients with hypoparathyroidism. And I think with that, I will end.